Why? Because they're burning more calories simply through these metabolic processes. Anyway, that doesn't mean you should eat 100% protein. It just explains why diets higher in protein work so well. One of the reasons. Now to simplify this, you want to eat satisfying, unaggressive, nutritious, and inefficient calories, which you don't need to remember. All you need to remember is water, fiber, protein. Because sane, healthy foods are high in water, fiber, and protein. Water, fiber, protein, water, fiber, protein. Unhealthy foods, low quality foods, are dry, low in fiber, and low in protein. So think way more of these foods that provide us what's essential, way less of what's not essential, and those foods are in order of volume. Like if you do nothing else, I'm not saying you should stop exercising, continue to exercise, but like literally just for 21 days, just, just try this, just willing suspension of disbelief, just try this. Eat way, way more non-starchy vegetables, way more. I'm talking double digit servings per day. Like try to find a way, breakfast, lunch, and dinner, get three servings of vegetables in at each meal. That'll get you to nine and then eat a snack. That'll get you to 10. And we describe how to do that uh, very efficiently, cost-effectively in the book. And when I say non-starchy vegetables, I mean vegetables you could eat raw. You don't have to eat them raw. In fact, I would encourage you not to eat them raw initially because you'll find them disgusting and then you'll stop doing it. I would encourage you to saute them in healthy fats such as coconut oil or even a bacon grease. Generally speaking, you want to cook in saturated fats because they don't oxidize under heat. We can talk about that later, but don't feel like you need to eat vegetables raw. Focus on green, leafy vegetables, saute them in a delicious, healthy fat, and put them on half of your plate. And of course, you can eat raw vegetables. Raw vegetables are fabulous for you. I just don't want that to deter you from eating vegetables in general. But again, vegetables that could be eaten raw. Potato can't be eaten raw. Corn can't be eaten raw. Those aren't vegetables. They're starches. Way more non-starchy vegetables. All right, so that's half of your plate, conceptually. That's the vast majority of the volume of food you're putting into your body. The vast majority should be non-starchy vegetables, especially green leafy vegetables. And you get bonus points for things like kale, for things like chard, for things like bok choy, spinach, romaine, Brussels sprouts, deep green leafy vegetables are literally therapeutic. They unclog your sink. They cure your allergies to tie back all the crazy analogies I've given in this presentation so far. Next on your plate and next in terms of volume should be nutrient dense protein. So these are foods that get the majority of their calories from protein. That's a really important point. The majority of their calories from protein. An egg is a very healthy food, but it gets 64% of its calories from fat and 35% from protein. It's a good source of fat. It's not a good source of protein. Nuts get about 80% of their calories from fat. If you want to get 30 grams of protein from nuts, you are going to overeat because they are not a good source of protein. They're a good source of fat. So when I say nutrient-dense protein, I mean foods that provide you the majority of their calories from protein, contain minimal toxins, and contain a bunch of essential vitamins and minerals. These are primarily, I know we've got vegetarians in the audience, so we can talk about this afterwards, but just primarily, these are found in seafood of any form, ideally wild caught, and humanely raised animals. So grass-fed beef, free-range chickens, generally eating sick animals will cause you to become sick as well. So it's better to eat humanely raised, non-sick animals. So any kind of seafood, eat a lot more seafood, and focus on eating nutrient-dense proteins such as animals that were raised humanely. More whole food fats. Right now, chances are, if you're like most Americans, you're getting the vast majority of your calories from starch or sugar. And it's not that carbs are bad. It's just that carbs are like fats and proteins. There's high quality sources, there's low quality sources. I want you to focus on high quality sources and that's why the primary focus of this way of living is non-starchy vegetables, which are carbohydrate. Just the highest quality sources. But if you're not eating all the sugar and starch, where are you getting your energy from? You're getting your energy from whole food fats. These are foods that get the most of their calories from fat and are found directly in nature, such as eggs, nuts, and seeds. Some of my favorite and some of the best for you are things like macadamia nuts, cocoa, coconut, chia seeds, flax seeds, fatty fish, eggs, olives, and avocados. They're fabulous for you. And in fact, by eating more fat rather than making you fat will help condition your body to burn stored fat. Here's the very quick version of how this works. You hear people talk about this on the internet like being fat adapted. Here's what this really means very quickly because we're running short on time. Right now, chances are, if you're eating 50 plus percent of your calories from carbohydrate, your body's sugar adapted, meaning it likes to run on sugar. 
you're giving it mostly sugar, so it's used to burning sugar. Okay? You can't really store sugar in your body. You have a teeny tiny bit stalled in your muscles called glycogen, but it's not a lot and it's used for like burst training and emergencies. It's like, it's like kindling. It's not your, your savings. It's not what fuels you throughout the day. So you can't store energy as sugar. So let's say you eat a lot of sugar. Your body's used to burning sugar. It wants to burn sugar. You eat a bunch of sugar for breakfast like most Americans do, and then your body burns through that sugar and it's hungry. You eat breakfast at 7 a.m. It's hungry at 9 a.m. Why is it hungry? Why is it hungry two hours later, especially if you have some excess fat, fat in your body? It's hungry because you feed it sugar. It's used to burning sugar. It wants to burn sugar. What's stored on your body? Not sugar. So by eating sugar, you're training your body to eat sugar, which makes you want to eat sugar because the only way your body can eat sugar is if you eat sugar. For example, if you eat mostly fat, most of your calories from fat, here's what happens. So you eat breakfast. Breakfast is egg base with a bunch of vegetables in it. You're going to get the majority of your calories from fat. You're going to get some wonderful protein as well. Nine o'clock comes around, your body's burned through those calories. What does it do? It says, I need some more calories and I like to burn fat. Huh, there's some fat over here. There's some fat over here. Just because fat didn't pass through your lips doesn't mean it then can't burn it off your hips. So ironically, while we've been told that eating fat makes us fat, eating fat in place of garbage carbohydrate enables your body to fuel itself using your stored fat. And this is really, really transformational because what people then start to experience is when they start eating this way, they experience what the research community calls a spontaneous reduction of caloric intake which just means they unconsciously get full on an appropriate number of calories. They're not trying to eat less. They just spontaneously do because ironically, they're not eating less. They're just supplementing the food that passes through their lips from the food that's already stored on their hips because their body has regained its ability to burn its stored body fat. So eat more whole food fats. This doesn't mean eat more spam. This doesn't mean eat more canola oil. This means eat more whole food fats. This also doesn't mean, and this might ruffle some feathers, eat more coconut oil. Coconut oil manufacturers will tell you, take two tablespoons of coconut oil per day. Coconut oil is a processed food. It doesn't mean you can't cook with it, but it means that I'd rather you eat coconut. Or olives in place of olive oil. Eat the whole food. Absolutely, you can cook with oils, but focus on getting the vast majority of your calories from whole food fats. Finally, more low fructose fruits. So this is gonna make some people in the audience sad, but the fruits that we mostly eat in this country, as, as one would expect based on the health and fitness outcomes we have in this country, are the very fruits that are highest in fructose and the lowest in vitamins and minerals, such as bananas, oh, grapes, oh man, and apples. What you really wanna focus eating more of are berries and citrus fruits blueberries, raspberries, blackberries, strawberries, as well as oranges, lemons, limes, and grapefruits. These are the fruits that maximize essential vitamins, minerals, amino acids, and minimize sugars, especially things like fructose, which cause all kinds of crazy neurological dysfunction in the brain when taken in excess. So you do that in place of processed fats, such as trans fats, seed oils, vegetable oil, spam, and in place of sugar and starch. So you actually eat more because these water fiber protein rich foods are packed, they're, they're huge. The volume of spinach you would need to eat to consume 300 calories is huge. But I want you, like you'll know you're doing this correctly when you eat between two and four pounds of food per day. Which I know sounds silly, but if you actually look at our ancestral records, that's what people ate back in the day because when you don't have calories jammed down into these sugar, starch, trans fat bites of death, <laughs> then the food you're eating is big and your shopping cart will be big and your refrigerator will be overflowing and your freezer will be overflowing, but your cupboards will be relatively sparse because foods high in water, fiber, and protein often need to be refrigerated or frozen. You'll also find these on the perimeter of your grocery store rather than the middle of your grocery store. You'll also find them in nature which all of this science, it's crazy because you look at all this science and it just gets back to like, doesn't it kind of make sense that the things you find directly in nature are the things that we run best on considering that they were only things available to us when we evolved? 
Or like even if you don't believe in evolution, like wouldn't intelligent design dictate that it's much more intelligent to design a creature that can live best off the things that are available to it rather than things that have only been available for the past 15 years? Like it just makes sense. So things look like this. It's delicious. We all do this. Like we've all eaten eggs for breakfast, unless we're vegetarian. We'll talk about that later. But like we've all eaten eggs for breakfast, and that's what I would encourage. Eggs with vegetables for breakfast, omelets, frittatas. You can make smoothies using things like chia seeds and flax seeds and cocoa and coconut. You can throw some green vegetables in the smoothie with some strawberries and some citrus, and it's yummy. And for lunch, it's just like what you're already eating, except you take the sandwich off the bread or you get the Thai food without putting it on top of rice, and you eat all of the main dish in sec except half of the main dish and half rice. And for dinner, like you can eat lasagna, just make it with eggplant noodles instead of regular noodles, or use spaghetti squash instead of spaghetti. Just eat more of the non-starchy vegetables and more of the chicken or steak rather than using things like rice and pasta and rolls as filler. I have not ever met anyone who has left a restaurant and just been like, oh my God, that rice was so good, right? It's used as filler. Don't, yeah. We all work at Microsoft. We all have the means. We can do this. We can enjoy the most delicious, healthy, nutritious foods on the planet. And it's wonderful. And if you just eat more of it, you'll be healthier as a result. And it's not about being perfect. Like, this isn't a diet. This isn't like, oh, you have to do this all the time. And if you fall off the wagon, you're dead. It's no, no, not at all. Like, think about your sink again. If you get a little bit of hair in your sink every once in a while, it doesn't cause a clog. It's the continuous, just like, ah, oh, get all the hair in the sink. That's when it gets clogged, right? So it's okay. You want to have a birthday cake at birthday? It's, yeah, it's your birthday. That's totally fine. Eventually, what you'll find is that when you eat this way, which I call a sane lifestyle because it's satisfying, unaggressive, nutritious, and inefficient, that it will make you feel and look so good that you'll start to be like, you know, hmm, I bet I could make that birthday cake with coconut flour and xylitol and still have birthday cake. And in fact, you know, I'm going to put some... I'm going to put some eggs in there, and wow, that's actually healthier for me than the dinner I used to eat, so I'm going to have birthday cake for dinner tonight, and that would be okay. It's about making smart substitutions, not depriving yourself. The thing that's so brilliant about this lifestyle, in addition to never needing to count calories and never needing to be hungry, is there's no flavor that's off limit. Sweet, salty, bitter, fatty, they're all possible. You just use like smart sweeteners, like stevia and lohango and xylitol or erythritol. Fat, we've already talked about, you can enjoy in abundance. Meaty, you can enjoy in abundance. Bitterness, vegetables are pretty bitter, but you'll get used to it, it's all right. You're gonna saute them in butter, so it's okay. And again, sweet fruit is fine. So, you'll get back to normal by getting back to normal, right? This seems like, oh my God, this is crazy. But again, this is how people ate prior to the obesity epidemic, right? The solution to ending the obesity epidemic is not to count calories more precisely as evidenced by the fact that no one knew what a calorie was, let alone count them prior to the obesity epidemic. The solution to the obesity epidemic is to stop doing the things that caused the obesity epidemic, which is eating non-food, processed products. Any culture anywhere in the world always, always, when they shift from their traditional diet that kept them healthy and slim without knowing what a gym was or knowing what a calorie was, and they start eating Pop-Tarts for breakfast, Lunchables for lunch, and microwave pizza for dinner, they become sick and diabetic. And it's not because they're eating more meat or this or that or the other thing. It's because they're not eating food. They're eating edible products. I don't care how hard you count calories eating edible products, you will struggle until you shift from thinking about food quantity and calorie quantity to food quality. And it can't be complex. It can't. How could we have survived as a species this long if not dying was hard? Right? Like this can't require these like Hollywood secret pill, take this root of some sort. It cannot require that because no one had this problem prior to those things existing. So anyway, hopefully that was helpful. There's a lot more research in the book. And of course, if you check out uh, calorymythbook.com, there's a lot more. We're just scratching the surface here, and I hope that was helpful. Thank you. Thank you. And do we, do we have time for questions? Cool. How much time do we have for questions? 15 minutes? Okay, cool. Sure. Um, and do we have mics for the questions? No mic. 
Okay. Um, yeah, and I'll repeat the question. To be fair, do you mind? Could we? Do you guys mind lining up in the aisle, and I'll go in order? Because otherwise, it's hard for me to pick who's first. <laughs> Is there? Good? Never mind. Okay, you can stay seated. I don't. Because if you burn more calories if you stand up, I'm just kidding. Okay. So no, go ahead, brother. What about dairy, milk, yogurt? Yeah. Question is, what about dairy? So, dairy is is much like other food groups. I would focus on. I'm sorry. Oh, thank you. <laughs> dairy, you want to focus on sources of dairy. One, you need to evaluate whether you personally do well with dairy. Some people don't have the enzyme lactase, and if you don't have lactase produced by your body, you aren't going to do well with dairy. So just test with yourself. That said, there are sources of dairy that provide you more of like an essential amino acid, such as like a Greek yogurt or a cottage cheese as compared to a traditional yogurt that's gonna provide you with way more sugar. So if you are gonna eat dairy, I would recommend focusing on dairy that provides you with the most protein and the least sugar. So things like Greek yogurt and cottage cheese. And then there are things like whey protein and casein protein supplements which are dairy based, which a lot of people can do well with. Is that cool? Yeah. Okay. What's your take on cleansing your body to sort of start afresh? The question is what I think about cleanses. I think I think if the, so popping up a level, anything you do that actually helps you is good. And anything you do that makes you feel worse is bad. I know that sounds stupid, but like I get a lot of questions of like, what do you think about this? And like if, if you do a cleanse and it makes you feel great and it makes you want to then after seven days eat this way, I would say absolutely do it. If a cleanse makes you think I can eat like garbage 21 days out of a month, and then for seven days cleanse my body out, like that would be a bad approach to cleanses. So if a cleanse you is a kickstart to eating this way, yes, but you can't cleanse forever. So I would just focus on what is the cleanse doing to help you achieve long-term lifestyle change, and if it helps you achieve long-term lifestyle change, then I'd recommend it. If it doesn't, or if it's used as like an excuse to eat processed starches and sweets and trans fats, then I would recommend against it. You're saying it's exactly. I'm sorry? The cleanse would be mental then? Is that what you're implying? I, I, there, there is not a lot of peer-reviewed scientific research that says that cleansing and then eating this way would yield dramatically better results than just eating this way. Make sense? OK, so I, I don't know who's next. Sorry, go ahead. Well, but what about uh, you know, this, the, what you're saying makes a lot of sense to me. And, uh, but what about the role of genetics? Like, you see yes. a family. Uh, I have this in my family. You know, where we live really different lives, but we yep. look almost identical, and you know, with weight problems, yep. and other uh, medical yes. problems. Yes. So no, thank you for bringing that up because it's very important. It's very important. Research is actually quite clear in the area of genetics, and that genetics are about 45 to 75 percent of your body composition. That's relatively cutting edge. What is not as cutting edge and is more common sense in the medical community is that there's three basic body types, ectomorph, which is generally taller and skinnier, mesomorph, which is right in the middle, and endomorph, which is a little bit heavier. Think about this like a football team. Even if you're not big into American football, you can usually empathize with this analogy. There are those people that are like very skinny and fast. They're called wide receivers. And then there are people who like go like this right before the play starts, and they're gigantic. Those are called linemen. Like if you look at a high school football team, they all eat basically the same, and they all exercise the same. Yet somehow, there's nothing this 300 pound guy can do to make himself look like the sprinter over here, right? So about 45 to 75% of this is genetically predetermined. That doesn't mean we can't become the optimal version of ourselves. It just means that, for example, like a lot of the people that we see in the media that have six pack abs, have a strong genetic predisposition to be able to visibly display their abs. And just like no matter how hard I try, I cannot be 6'3". I can't. Like I can't just try harder to be taller. That doesn't mean I can't like nourish my body appropriately when I'm growing up so that my bones will grow as large as they can grow. But the key distinction here is that yes, there is a strong genetic component and we need to hold ourselves relative to ourselves. So think back to when you were at your fittest. Usually it's the end of high school, early college. And fortunately, we are the generation that can remember this because today's kids won't even be able to remember this because they're overweight under the age of five, which is a whole other thing, which is heartbreaking, but whatever. Think about when you were your fittest. 
try to get back to that. And what you'll actually find is you will get back to that without trying if you just eat this way. But don't think about like, how do I look like Joe Smith, extreme exercise DVD guy? Don't, don't think about that. I'm gonna go this side of the room next, sure. Uh, so I've moved away from cooking and flavoring uh, stuff with butter to olive oil. Now, which way would you recommend <clears throat> frying eggs with butter versus frying eggs? It, yeah, it depends on if you're using it hot or cold. So if you're cooking, if you're heating it, you should use sat uh, healthy saturated fats, such as butter, coconut oil, uh, beef tallow, bacon drippings. The reason for this is those, the, the saturated fats are more stable under heat. If you take something like an olive oil or a fat that's liquid at room temperature and you heat it, what you essentially do is you turn it into a trans fat. So olive oil, which is healthy when you, it is, olives are healthier, but <laughs> olive oil, which can be a healthy salad dressing, for example, when heated, turns into a trans fat. So you don't want to cook with olive oil, you want to cook with saturated fats, and you, if you want to put dressing on a salad, using an olive oil and a vinegar rather than trying to take coconut oil and rubbing it on the leaves is probably a fine approach. <laughs> Very cool? Yeah. How many times have people come back to you and said, Jonathan, I've done everything you've said to do in your book and it doesn't work for me? Uh, you would be the first. I'm not saying that that's <laughs> okay. I'm just asking if that's Yeah, well, what, what I experience most often is people will say, Jonathan, I've done everything you're saying and it hasn't worked. And I say to them, how many servings of vegetables have you eaten today? And they'll say, two or zero. Because what most people find is that eating more protein is easy, it's delicious, and eating more fat is easy. But until someone can take a week and consume 12 to 15 servings of non-starchy vegetables, at least six of which are green, for a week consistently, like that's not an easy thing to do when you first get started. It's like trying to become a vegetarian. It's not easy to begin with. But if you can do that, I have never had someone come up to me that actually eats double-digit servings of non-starchy vegetables, protein in 30-gram doses about three times a day, three to five, and whole food fats, and occasionally low-fructose fruits in place of these other things, and doesn't achieve the results we're describing here. Yeah. Oh, okay. If they happen or not. Yes. Does that answer your question? Yes. Okay, cool. Yes. Um, Back to the, uh, when you were talking about protein being transformed into glucose mm -hmm. by your liver, is it possible to eat like more than that 30 gram mm -hmm. serving and have your body, even though you're eating a lot of protein, still run off of that sugar that it's getting transformed into? Yes, in so, food? yes. Um, protein, pro so the, sorry, the question is, oh, did I not, and I didn't repeat your question, sorry, the last question was, has anyone ever done this and it hasn't worked? The question uh, here is essentially, can you, cause your blood sugar to go up? Can you get weight gain by overeating protein? Uh, the answer is yes. It's very hard to do though. It's very hard to do. The only way to really do it would be through protein supplementation. Because for example, uh, if you were to try to do this with even the, the most concentrated sources of protein, like a can of tuna fish is one of the most concentrated sources of protein in the world. It's like 91% protein. You would have to eat like three cans of tuna in one sitting to eat enough protein to go through gluconeogenesis to actually have an impact on your blood sugar. If you are very, sent, like if you're a diabetic and you're, you're looking at your blood sugar, it is important to note, this is getting really geeky, but that different sources of protein are, have different levels uh, of an insulinic response. So dairy protein, especially things like whey, has a huge insulin response. This is why bodybuilders use it a lot or athletes use it a lot because insulin isn't bad. Excess insulin is bad. In fact, if you don't have enough insulin, you die. It's called type one diabetes. So insulin isn't bad. It's excess insulin that's bad. So uh, dairy forms of protein generally have a higher insulinic response. Overeating protein is very, very difficult, especially if you're eating vegetables, but it can be done. Oh, okay. Yes. Um, I'm a distance runner by application. And um, obviously, since I burn more, I need to eat more. Mm -hmm. But do I need to rebalance that 40 40 20 or just keep the 40 40 20 and just eat more of it? I would, especially for endurance athletes, two things. Um, I would recommend reading the book, The Art and Science of Low Carbohydrate Performance by Jeff Volok and Steve Finney. Um, they're doing some very cutting edge research at uh, Duke University Medical Center and other places, which is to traditionally endurance athletes have been told to like take glucose packets and carb up. But remember, you can only store about 1,800 calories of glucose on your body. So, Exactly. Whereas you can store lots of fat on your body, right? So if you really want to be an ultra-endurance athlete, I would highly, highly recommend 
going out of your way to consume more concentrated sources of healthy fats such as macadamia nuts, cocoa, and coconut. And the, the great news is like if you're going on a long run, you can put a thousand calories of macadamia nuts in your pocket very easily. So does that help? Yep. And sorry, the question was, ah, I'm an endurance athlete, what do I do? And that was my answer. So sorry. Yes. One more question. Oh, one more question. Oh, no. Oh, <laughs> man. Okay, whoever stands up next gets the next question. <laughs> <laughs> Two more questions, okay. <laughs> you can go first. Um, I listen to your podcast, so I know that you have lots of friends in the paleo community. They respect you, you respect them, but your eating um, sort of recommendations aren't exactly the same. And I'm thinking things like raw spinach and raw kale, um, peanuts, uh, whey, concentrate, um, and like even eggs. Yeah, yeah. So what can I do in your food choices and recommendations? And like how do we make this sense yeah. of sort of these very complementary um, kind of approaches, like lifestyle choices? So. Uh, the question is basically how does what I'm saying jive or not jive with, with a paleo type lifestyle? Is that fair? Sure. And, in, yeah. and how do I like, and, and so uh, another way to think of the question is a paleo lifestyle is guided by a principle. The principle is by eating the way our ancestors ate, you will be healthy. That is the underlying principle of, of, of the paleo lifestyle. And it is, it is uh, by and large true. Um, the principle that underlies what I'm recommending is eat foods that provide you with the most of that which is essential and the least of which is non-essential and that will maximize your health. And those two circles overlap immensely, but there are some exceptions like the paleo diet. Uh, also the paleo diet is predicated on helping people to heal autoimmune diseases. Whereas this lifestyle is not, that happens, but it's not uh, the, the goal. It was not designed to do that. Um, the biggest outliers, the biggest differences you'll see between the two lifestyles is uh, paleo lifestyle will uh, say it is okay to eat certain forms of starch as long as they're found in nature as well as uh, sweeteners such as honey because they're found in nature. Now, the paleo, to me, if you wanted to just like pick a diet, the paleo diet is the diet I would recommend without question, without question. That said, the the barometer that if our ancestors ate it or if it's found in nature that we can stop there is an inadequate bar because tobacco is found directly in nature. Uh, Sugarcane is found directly in nature. There's a lot of things. Snake venom is found directly in nature. <laughs> so what I like to do is say, okay, start with the baseline of like the default hypothesis is if it exists in nature, cool, like check. Now, uh, is it satisfying? Is it unaggressive? Is it nutritious? Is it inefficient? AKA, is it higher in water, fiber, and protein than some other options I could be eating? If the answer is yes, then I'd be like, yeah, that's a good choice. And then of course, there's this other track here where it's not found directly in nature, but it still is sane. And uh, this is just kind of a job. I mean, I'm speaking at Paleo FX in a few weeks, so like, I'm, again, all respect to the Paleo community completely, but like, we didn't have blogs back in the day but like paleo people blog all the time. So, so just because it's modern also doesn't mean it's bad. And, and the, like the real hardcore paleo folks like Rob Wolf, Chris Kresser, like they all say the same basic thing. It's like, you know, Chris is like dairy works for some people. His whole book is, is about those customizations. So does that answer your question? Kind of? Kind of. Kind of. But okay. No, I, I just was more specific like, um, like peanuts, are they inflamed? Like, or, or, you know, do, okay, do I keep my raw spinach casein smoothie or you yeah. know whey smoothie in the morning is it going to spike my blood sugar and, and cause me yeah i don't know like hypothyroid problems or something like yep. you know because they've got very specific yeah so like, my personal so i think i believe the paleo diet is a therapeutic diet for people with autoimmune disorders um people spent a lot less time thinking about what they were eating. And in fact, like my great grandmother, back in the time when we had sub 3% rates of obesity, they ate cookies, cakes, pies, dairy, they ate all that stuff. And they had dramatically lower levels of disease than we do today. So I personally believe it's very easy to become what's called orthorexic, which is you start to spend so much time thinking about what you're eating that it, the pursuit of health becomes unhealthy. <laughs> so that's why I like really like non-starchy vegetables, nutrient-dense protein, whole food fats, low fructose fruits, in that order, and you will be fine. Cool? And I believe there was a... Right there. In a vegetarian diet, what protein sources do you recommend? Because they very often seem to be combined with carbohydrates. Yes, great question. I'm glad we got to cover it. So the question is, uh, for a vegetarian diet, where do I get my nutrient-dense protein sources from? So 
a vegetarian diet um, can be a more challenging diet to eat this way on. That doesn't mean it's impossible. What I would highly, highly, highly recommend is this, and this is gonna, this is gonna sound bad, but you're gonna have to almost write off getting your protein from what you've been told to get it from, beans, soy, rice, things like that, because uh, like soy is 70% carbohydrate by weight, beans are 70% carbohydrate by weight, nuts are 80% fat by weight. So if you try to get a 30 gram dose of protein from those sources, it's literally, you just, you can't eat that much food. So what I would recommend for most vegetarians is focus a couple things. Get pea, hemp, or rice, get a pea, hemp, or rice protein supplement, just straight out of the gate. Um, I would also get an amino acid supplement. And then I would say, so that's step one, and that covers your protein. Then with your meals, I would highly recommend shifting more vegetables, more fruits, and more plant fats, like nuts and seeds. I mean, most of the healthy fats I mentioned were all plants, and that can be the bulk of your calories, rather than getting the bulk of your calories from soy, corn, wheat, um, a lot of the things that a lot of plant-based products are made out of are some of the least nutritious foods and have now been so genetically modified and hybridized that they're really, really bad. So it, in three steps, one is use a hemp, pea, or rice protein supplementation as well as an amino acid supplement to take care of the protein requirements, and then focus on getting the bulk of your calories from whole food plant fats rather than starches. Does that help? Okay. Cool, and I, I personally will stay around to answer more questions. Is it just that we can't videotape them, or what? Is it? Can I answer more questions? Or? Okay. Cool. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available.